Hi, I'm very pleased to be here to do this actually. It's, um, it's probably high time that I gave a, 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 more, a less formal talk about uh, iridology than I'm doing in my classroom at the moment where I'm stuffing their heads full of facts and figures. Uh, for you, this I hope will be a, you know, a, a pleasant and, and instructive and hopefully inspiring journey through a subject that, um, as Herman suggested, um, ha has sort of been downgraded a lot. In, uh, in, in this particular country, although it is very highly regarded in other places. Um, iridology is usually known as a complementary diagnostic discipline. However, you might be surprised to know that um, it, it's been developed largely by medical doctors around the world and in some places in the world, notably Russia, as Herman mentioned, also Germany, um, Korea, and China increasingly, it's becoming a mainstream technique. In some places, diagnostic um, efficiency of uh, iridology has been put as high as 80%. And when you're looking at studies that sometimes um, list the diagnostic efficiency of, um, of your average GP surgery at somewhere between 20 and 30%, that's obviously got to be quite significant. Good. Um, I want to... <laughs> I want to pick up on a point that Herman made just now, actually, which is about the individuality of the patient. Um, we're trying to get away from a sort of one-size-fits-all uh, treatment program. The treatment program has to fit the individual that's in front of you. But how do we get the information that we need about that individuality? Um, you know, if you look in a lot of the old herbals, uh, sort of classic, sort of popular herbal references, you'll find that this herb is for high blood pressure or this herb is for arthritis. Um, and that's a kind of a, what we might call a disease-centered approach. You know, we look at the disease, which is the final outcome, if you like, of a series of processes that might have been taking place in the individual over a period of time. And we concentrate on that as the thing to be somehow targeted. And that sometimes results in what we call an allopathic approach to disease, where the removal of the symptom is uh, mistaken, if you like, for a cure. Um, what we're more concerned about here is how to get the information that will lead us to understand the reasons why the symptom is there in the first place. So I think that Herman's introduction was very apposite to ir iridology particularly because um, when we start looking at people's eyes, we find this uh, incredible variety reflected there. Um, every person on the planet has completely unique eyes. Um, we're going to be talking about one part of the eye called the iris, the plural of which, by the way, is irides. So if I say that word, you now know what it means. So when we're looking at the irides, you, any one of you in this room, not only have a completely unique iris, you have two. And then nowhere, there, there are, there may be falling into certain patterns which we recognize and which we can talk about constitutional types, but there's not one person on the planet who has irides identical to yours. More than that, there's not one person who has ever existed on the planet who has irides identical to yours. So it is a true um, indicator of your personal uniqueness. Um, it is now increasingly being used as a bio-identifier. I don't know whether anybody's been through um, any passport controls where they use iris identification. I gather there's one in Amsterdam at the moment, and I think they're springing up in various places. Sometimes you now uh, can have your iris uh, photographs recorded as part of the chip that they now put into UK passports as well. So the uniqueness of the iris is, is certainly recognised by the authorities um, and will... In fact, it's, it's about 100... Um, Sorry, it's about 10 times more detailed than your fingerprints as an analysis of who you are. So in, a, in, a, in the average fingerprint identification, they're looking for 17 signs to coincide to tell them that that is actually you. Um, but of course, that can often go wrong. As we know, fingerprinting isn't infallible. The iris, on the, contra uh, on the other hand, uh, is, is, has a possibility of up to 200 different signs in each iris. So it's a, a lot more details, as you can see. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a little bit discussion first about diagnosis, about this problem of finding out about the ind individual. Now, when we, one of the things that distinguishes us as um, complementary therapists, if you like, something that people quite often pick up on, is we spend a lot of time with our patients. 
You know, a first consultation might be an hour, might even be an hour and a half in some cases. And that consultation is specifically an information gathering exercise. We ask a lot of very detailed questions about your health patterns, about specific anatomical or physiological functions, um, and of course about lifestyle, diet, and of course about family history as well. So we do a lot of verbal inter um, information gathering. <laughs> We also look at certain diagnostic signs. You know, we teach some TCM, which is traditional Chinese medicine here. We teach some Ayurveda, which gives us other tools for assessing an individual's health level. For example, in TCM, they use the tongue, they use the pulses, uh, they use certain, uh, some, some TCM practitioners look at the face, the sort of physio, physiognomy, if you like, to see um, uh, signs, and a lot of that is about constitution, by the way. In Ayurveda, they do very much the same thing. They assess what they call prakriti and vikruti, if you know what those terms mean. Prakriti is your constitution when you're born, and vikruti is what happens to it through the, uh, the course of life, and of course it can actually change. So when we're talking about constitution, the individual constitution, we always see see it also as a changeable, versatile and adaptable phenomenon. Constitution basically, at the, if you start looking at it from an iridology perspective, constitution describes the way in which your body adapts, or perhaps fails to adapt, to the circumstance that it finds in life. Okay? So we use all of these techniques to gather information. Where iridology comes in is um, Somewhere along the line, we need to be able to get some kind of internal readout, if you like, of what, uh, of what, the, body, uh, what the body's predispositions actually are. We can sometimes read it from the case history and from looking at the signs and symptoms, but sometimes we can't. We may have a symptom. Let's take, for example, asthma. Now, a lot of people associate asthma with various things. It can be associated with generalized congestion in the lung area. It can be associated with nervous impulses, i.e. anxiety. And it can be associated with immune uh, disorders, such as allergy, in which we get atopic asthma. So to find out what sort of asthma you've got or, or what the best route to treating it is, we need to have a little bit of a, a look inside, if you like. We need to know more about the constitution. So, in other words, what we're saying is here, this is a definition of constitution that comes from the medical dictionary. And um, it describes it as the post, uh, sorry, um, it's a definition of diagnosis, not of constitution. The process of determining the nature of a disorder by considering the patient's signs and symptoms, the medical background, and when necessary, the results of laboratory tests and x-ray um, examination. So what that basically says is the whole thrust of a diagnosis in medical terms is what? To find what kind of disease you've got. Okay? And once you know the disease you can then match it with the remedy. That's the sort of classic conventional idea of diagnosis. Do you think that works for us? Do you think it's all about the name of the disease? No, good, um, because it isn't. And we don't like to use the word diagnosis too much in iridology, actually. We might talk about it being a diagnostic tool. It's one element of a whole process that you go through which results in a diagnosis. But we want something more. Um, so we might choose a, a couple of other words. Analysis is one that comes to mind. Um, now, again, there's a definition of analysis there, which is kind of a little bit atomistic, which means it breaks things down. The separation of something into constituent parts in order to find out what it contains. The examination of individual parts, which may describe more of a medical approach, really. You know, you go to a hospital and you see a urologist, and then he says, well, I think there might be a nervous involvement, so you then go and see a neurologist, and etc., uh, etc. Et but they don't really cross over very much. Um, but the, the last part of it, I think, is uh, very relevant to the way we think about things here. And I put that in, in italics, to study the structure of the whole. So this reminds us that we are actually looking at a whole person, and yes, they've got a number of different problems that may affect different parts of the body, but what we want to find out is how those different parts, those different manifestations, fit together in a kind of a logical system, okay? Because whenever you get ill, it's not that one part has malfunctioned. It's not like your car goes wrong, so you take the uh, coil out and put another one in and it goes fine again. You know, with a human body, it's different. The coil has malfunctioned for a reason, and we need to find out what that reason is, okay? Uh, and that's much more to do with the, the way that the body functions as a whole. There's a whole um, uh, field of med medicine opening up in America at the moment called functional medicine. Has anybody heard of 
functional medicine. Um, and functional medicine to me is naturopathy brought into the 21st century. It's naturopathy with a, uh, you know, with a, with a scientific rationale, exactly. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence uh, in support of that. And what I've always predicted for the last 35 years I've been in, involved in natural medicine is that one day science will catch up with us. Um, and it's not the other way around. You know, science is now revealing what we always knew to be true and that the body is a functioning harmonious unit that needs to be looked after as a whole. That when something goes wrong with a part of it, you need to look at the whole system to find out why that is. Okay? So it, studying the structure of the whole is what we do in iridology. And I'm just going to put this one up here. You might recognize this quotation from a very famous man uh, known affectionately as the father of modern medicine. Um, he's really the father of naturopathy because his methods were exclusively naturopathic, actually, and very much in the, you know, we actually study Hippocrates as part of our herbal medicine course because he contains the ideas, the philosophies, and the background that we work from. And many herbalists through the ages have also looked back to Hippocrates for the answers to their uh, questions as well. So this is a very famous quotation which is right on the button as far as our subject here is concerned. It's more interesting to know, I'm sorry about the gender specificity here, but that's the, the, the translation. Uh, what kind of man has a disease than to know the disease the man hath was the original translation. In other words, it's more important what kind of person you've got in front of you as we said before. Now what Hippocrates noticed was the same two people manifesting similar symptoms and the same nominal disease might progress through that experience in, a very, in very different ways. So one person might actually die of it and the other person will throw a fever but they'll get through it and they'll survive and they'll be actually stronger afterwards. Okay? So in other words, it makes a difference uh, what kind of person you've got in front of you as to how we resist or resolve our health crises. Yeah? So again, we're coming down to looking at the iris for, um, for what it can tell us about that sort of deeply individual uh, nature. Now, let's not go too far uh, overboard with this. We all have uh, a couple of lungs, uh, a liver, two kidneys, a brain, hopefully, um, you know, a, a gastrointestinal tract and some nerves. So we've all got the same kit, but Within that similarity of human physiology and human anatomy, there are very, very different manifestations. You know, not just the way we look, but also the way we might behave, the way we comport ourselves, the way we re react or respond to stress, for example, is a big marker these days for, um, you know, for assessing how an individual's health might have, uh, what turns an indiv individual's health might have taken throughout the course of their life. Now, the eyes have always been uh, an indicator of something, haven't they? Um, the eyes are somehow, you know, almost quasi-magical for people. You can sort of get a sense of who someone is and how they're feeling uh, by subtle signals that come from the eyes. This has been, you know, when they say the eyes are the windows of the soul, that's partly what they mean, I suppose. Um, so from time immemorial, we've been captivated by the eyes and we've noticed something about them. I'm not going to do a big history of iridology here. Iridology itself is quite a new science. If we bring it up to date and we ask ourselves, what do the medics say about the iris? And I've actually had this out with a few of them too. Um, a few facts come to light. Medically, it's known as an aperture that controls the light entering the eye. So in fact, it's a sphincter and a dilator muscle. So behind the coloured portion of the iris that we all know, um, there, is, there are these two very functional pieces of, uh, of tissue. One is a sphincter, which closes the pupil, and the other is a dilator, which expands the pupil. Um, and that begs the question, to what, uh, in response to what, do these um, actions take place? And obviously one of the answers to that is that if you shine a bright light in someone's eyes, their pupils will contract because it, it, it doesn't want that much light in the eye. Has anybody ever continued to shine that light in the eye and found out what happens next? It's very interesting because you'd think that it stays closed as long as the eyes, uh, uh, you know, the, the pupil say it stays narrow as long as the uh, light's shining, but it doesn't. What happens is that slowly, over a few seconds, it expands again to where it was before. 
which is a really interesting fact. In other words, we all have a sort of default aperture that's balanced by the operation of our nerve supply and the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerves. That in itself is something which tells, which gives us a lot of information about iridology. Um, so in fact, for example, if you have a very expanded or, or wide pupil, um, you are said to be sympathetically dominant. Sympathetic otonia is what we call it, where the sympathetic part of the nervous system is more active. Okay? That can tell us something quite important about the way a person responds to life. Yeah? Uh, and conversely, if the pupil is very narrow, we get a parasympathetic dominance. This is a person that might, uh, um, on the surface, appear to be much more laid back, but they also may, to some extent, be quite sluggish and have a lack of interest in life, etc. So, in other words, that simple polarity between the sphincter and the dilator muscle and the way that they're um, managed, if you like, by the nerve system, uh, in itself gives us a lot of information that, in fact, isn't commented much uh, on much in, in terms of, of conventional medicine, but which we take quite seriously as a, a one of the first indicators of, it, of individual um, stress response, for example. The pupil in the middle of the eye, oh, yeah? That's narrow. That's right. Do you know the pupil is, is a hole? Yeah. It's just a hole. It goes right through the middle of the iris, and behind that is the lens, which, which, which uh, bends the light and focuses it onto the retina. Okay? So that's, the, that's where the light gets in. Right. Okay? If it's narrow, it's more parasympathetic. That's right. Narrow is parasympathetic and... Large and large is, uh, sympathetic. is sympathetic, that's right. So obviously it changes a lot, and it can change a lot according to experience, but it can also change during the course of life. Um, it's not un, uh, 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 unknown, for example, for people's pupils to, to actually shrink as they get older. It's one of the changes that takes place, because they slow down a lot, because their um, they're, they're sympathetic nerve system becomes a little bit exhausted sometimes. Uh, they tend to be very outgoing, very reactive, very sort of, you know, charged up, if you like, adrenally charged people, yeah? Um, can that change acutely? Really it can change acutely, that's right, yeah, yeah. And, and, that's a, and it, it's an indicator of where you are now, uh, in contrast to the iris itself, which we're coming to in a minute, which is an indicator more of long-term constitutional trends. But just to make the point, um, the, other, the other point that's worth <laughs> making about those two functions is that the sympathetic nerve system, which controls the dilator muscle, is confined to the outer portion of the iris disc. I'm going to show you iris picture in a minute. We can, just, we can talk about this with something in front of us. Whereas the parasympathetic, which control, controls the sphincter muscle that closes the pupil, is more involved with the central portion of the iris. An interesting fact here is that the central portion of the iris is concerned with digestion in iridology. It's a reflex to the digestive tract. So if I ask you the question, what kind of nerve balance do we want when we're digesting food? Do we want to be relaxed and chilled out? Or do we want to be uh, buzzed up and, uh, or, and, and stressed out? And the answer, of course, is obvious. We, we need to be relaxed. The parasympathetic function of the nerve system governs digestion. Okay? So there's an interesting fact about the actual way the iris is wired up in the first place, which is that the nerves that must be dominant, that control the digestive function, also control the area of the iris that we associate with digestion. And we can tell a lot about digestive function by that tone as well. That's the opposite way, because you know, when, when you go to ophthalmologist, yeah. they sometimes dilate the pupil. That's right. And yeah. under that circumstances, our, uh, the, there's our nervous system um, moved towards sympathetic nervous system dominant. Yes. Really? Yes, it would do. Oh. But um, that particular drug they used to do that, pilocarpine, has its own effects anyway. So it's, it's some, to some extent it is uh, an artificial effect, that one. But uh, if you were to, to, to make that happen long term, then yes, you would unba unbalance the nerve system. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a, a view of what's happening, if you like, behind the, uh, the, 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 the main structure of the iris. When you think about the iris of an individual, you think literally about the colour of someone's eye. It's the coloured portion of the, uh, uh, of the eye that's bang in the middle there, just around the pupil. So the first thing we notice is colour, and colour is, an, is actually a very important indicator. The first 
ca uh, category or classification of constitution comes by observing colour. And this is a very wide category because obviously there are very, you know, there's a relatively narrow range of colours that are seen in the iris. Uh, there's the very dark brown and there's the very pale blue and there's sort of anything in between but they're basically a mixture of uh, something between blue or blue-grey and brown. It can look green because sometimes the mixture of colours gives that impression but if you look close up at the iris there's no such colour as green in the iris. Anybody here who think they have green eyes? Yeah, so if we were to look at your eyes closely, we would find that there's underlying blue-gray with a little bit of yellowish or brownish pigment over the top that gives that impression of greenness. So everything's a mixture of somewhere between blue and brown. Sorry, just quickly, um, I've heard people doing some major detoxing and their eye colors changing, like colour. I'm, I, I kind of, um, uh, like to downplay that a bit. This was an idea that came out of the early days of iridology where it was felt that the brown colour reflected some kind of toxicity. And there's a danger in that because actually you will never turn a, a brown eye blue through detoxification. And to some extent it was rooted in ideas that are arguably racist. And, th and that charge was levelled at some early iridologists. So it's not something we like to to dwell on these days. There is a category of pigmentation that can, over a significant period of time, reduce slightly with, with detox measures, but it would be wrong to give the idea that if you have brown eyes, uh, you know, you ought to be working to clear them, if you like, okay? So brown eyes are a genetic pattern, basically, um, and a lot of this actually is genetic, as we'll find out in, in a short while. So what we're looking at is what we call the fibre structure, the individual iris print. And I reckon, if I'm right, it's time we actually saw one. There we go. Now this is a light brown or mid-brown iris. It's not completely the darkest type available. But one of, the things I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to put this one up here particularly was because it gives a very clear view of that fibre structure. If you look at the interior portion of the iris, it here is, is divided, as all of them are actually, into two roughly concentric zones. They're not perfectly circular, but that structure that divides the outer portion of the iris from the inner portion is quite um, significant in iridology. We call it the autonomic nerve wreath. And we've just been talking about the dynamic interaction between sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve systems. So you might imagine that we can get quite a lot of information about that also from the autonomic nerve wreath. And that zone inside, um, which is the one where you can see all the fibre structure very, very clearly. You know, it's a very individual pattern, this one. We have holes in the texture, uh, these kind of radial um, uh, fibres there. Um, the, the precise layout of that is what gives the iris its individuality. And that's where we would start looking to find out what the tissue uh, states were like within the body of the person concerned. So in other words, what we could do, before we've even taken a case history, we could look at this person and I'd be going, okay, I want to know a few things about, uh, about you before you start. Do you, for example, I would say one of the things that might be occurring there is, do you, are you constipated? Do you have a tendency to sluggish bowel motions? Do you have a tendency to bloating? Do you have a tendency to un, un, unhappy or uncomfortable conditions in the digestive tract? This is a type, this is a pattern, that we call the gastric type, um, which we associate with all sorts of gastrointestinal disturbances, okay? Um, so in other words, uh, what we're doing here is we're getting a snapshot of what somebody's health, health patterns might be revealing. It doesn't mean to say uh, that, that that's the only problem that they've got or that that's the only thing that's gonna happen to them. It doesn't even mean to say that they've definitely got a problem. It might mean that they've got a susceptibility to a problem, but, they ha but they've, because they've been eating well and looking after themselves, it hasn't really surfaced. The other thing we need to say about the iris from that point of view is that when we're looking at the iris, there's a tendency, if we're fo again, if we're focused on pathology, to think that uh, everything we see in the iris has to be assigned a negative value, that it has to be a, a marker of disease or degeneration or something like that. That's not actually the case. There is no such thing as a bad iris constitution or a bad iris structure. There are only good and bad ways of living with what you've got. Do you understand that? So in other words, what the iris tells us, if you like, is our limits of competence. Um, limits of competence? 
Uh, I didn't really mean to say that. I meant limits of uh, tolerance, okay? Limits of tolerance, I'm talking as a herbalist there, limits of competence, I've got all the regulatory stuff in my head there. Uh, limits of tolerance, in other words, we all know people who can go out there, smoke 30 cigarettes a day, drink 10 pints of beer a night, eat fish and chips and pizza till uh, there's nothing left, and still live to the age of 107, okay? But if most of us did that, or if some of us did that, we'd fall over pretty quickly, okay? Do you, do you see what I mean? Tolerance to stress, tolerance to um, uh, nutritional deficiencies, for example, tolerance to um, having to work too hard, or whatever it happens to be. So we're all different in that respect. We have people who can plow on and on and on and never seem to be affected by it, do with very little sleep, still plowing on and on and on, leaving the rest of us standing. We have people who really need to keep that regularity, the good diet, the regular sleep, etc. And that's partly what we're looking at here, individual tolerances. So if you have one of those constitutions, or if like this person you have a constitution with a little bit of weakness in the digestive area, all you need to do is to learn the right techniques for managing that, to learn the diet that suits you, to learn the lifestyle that suits you. So part of what we do as iridologists is to counsel people on the basis of their constitutional susceptibilities, what kind of diet, what kind of life will suit them. And that's a big part of what a naturopath does. One of the seven principles of naturopathy is that we should be teachers to our patients. We're not just there to tell them what's good for them and, and give them remedies and act as the doctor in the white coat. We're there as a friend to help them to find the way uh, that they can actually best manage their own health. Okay, so this information is very useful. You have an iridology reading, not just to benefit me as a practitioner, saying, okay, now I know you need this herb or this remedy or this nutritional supplement because of what's in there, uh, but also to point things out to people, to use it as, a, if you like, a visual impact learning tool so that they can make connections for themselves and go out of that consultation feeling empowered to do what they need to do to manage their health to, um, you know, to, to avoid problems. So it's as much to do with prevention, actually, as it is to do with cure. Okay, um, the contemporary position in iridology is that very little changes in the iris. The iris is not fully formed at birth. The iris at birth is a dark, undifferentiated pool. It hasn't fully crystallized. So all that fiber structure that you can see there, that doesn't exist. You can see it almost like coming into definition, almost like coming into focus as the child goes through the first two, three, four months of life. By the age of four months, the fiber structure, the precise layout of all those little fibers, any holes in the texture that you can see there, are fully formed. Some of the pigment, we've got a sort of a distribution of yellowish pigment around the center there and a couple of, of, of darker, well, one big dark spot at the top, that might come in a little bit later. It might come in within the first five to six years or sometimes it might come in in adolescence. So frequently we develop more pigment uh, as we go through the sort of last big sort of development stage in our lives, which is the growth to adult maturity. And at that point, we can also find things changing in the iris and arriving in the iris. But generally speaking, one of the old ideas in iridology was that if you get ill, your eyes would start almost like falling to pieces or developing holes that, that would tell you that there were degenerative processes going on inside. We now know that that doesn't happen. All the signs that we associate with degenerative processes because they've been found in sick people are visible in very young children. So this was a big conundrum actually. If I just take you through very quickly through a little bit of iridology history, um, just to put this in perspective, I'm not going to do a, a you know, it's a, it's a huge history and, it, and it's worthy of study, but I just want to present a couple of things just really because it gets uh, puts the sort of theory of iridology in perspective. Um, as I said, the eyes have always been regarded as important. This slide here um, shows us how the eyes are regarded in traditional Chinese medicine with certain portions of the iris, you know, not just the, uh, of the eye, not just the iris itself, but the whites of the eye, the inner and outer corners of the eye, the eyelids um, uh, are associated with specific organs. And um, a, ch a Chinese practitioner, a TCM practitioner, would quite often look at the face and the eye 
eyes in general uh, just for those uh, signs. Um, but it wasn't until we started to develop optical sciences that we really began to look very closely. If you think about it, it's a small structure and a lot of these, so we're blowing up uh, big eyes on the, on the screen here, but it's a very small structure and you need some magnification to be able to see it. So we couldn't really get going on iridology until we had something which would, um, uh, which would allow us to see at that depth. Um, so this guy, Ignaz von Peskely, who was a Hungarian, he was born in 1826 and he's known as the father of iridology. Um, and the famous story about von Peskely is that he found an owl, is there somebody from Hungary over there? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, von Peskely, um, uh, famously what he did was he, 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 he he, he found an owl that had got caught, caught up in a hunter's snare and he rescued the owl from the snare but in doing so the owl's leg broke and he was uh, obviously mortified about this. He took the owl home, splinted the leg and looked after it until it was better and the owl reportedly was so grateful that it stayed the rest of its life in his garden. Uh, so he was able to see, what he said he saw was when he broke the owl's leg, he said that he saw a dark stripe appear in the, uh, in the iris of the owl, and as the owl's leg mended, that sort of faded out until it became normal again. This is what we call an apocryphal story. We don't know whether it's true, and you couldn't possibly replicate it, and you know, you, it wouldn't be terribly ethical to go around breaking animals' legs in order to find out whether they exhibit uh, signs in the iris. But the, the, the point of the story is not that there was something going on with an owl, but that he started to look at eyes, and he saw, Something's going on in the iris. So he then started to look. Um, he originally uh, studied homeopathy, but he used the eye as part of his diagnostic technique. And he got such a reputation that people would come to him from miles around, from, even from, from the rest of Europe. They'd travel to see this guy who claimed that he could diagnose you by looking in your eyes. As these things go, it wasn't long before a doctor came up and said, naughty, 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 what are you doing? So he then said, right, uh, let me have a look at your eyes. And he looked in his eyes and he gave him a precise readout of all his medical conditions, which shut the guy up for good. But he also thought, right, I'm not going to be caught out by th like that again. So he trained to be a doctor. And that gave him an ideal location to do his researches. Uh, so, uh, you know, working in hospitals, working with people who had diseases that he could check against the signs that he was seeing in the iris. And of course, working on autopsies with cadavers as well. The only problem is that, what do you find in hospitals? What sort of people do you get? Sick people. And what, do you, what sort of people do you get in mortuaries? dead people. Okay? So seeing a lot of sick and dead people, and yes, there was a lot of pathology going on there. What puzzled him was that when he looked at healthy people, he saw some of the same signs. So uh, this resulted in a little bit of a problem for him. Um, these are uh, the sort of facts which you don't really need at this stage. You, if you want this presentation, by the way, I can make it available to you. Um, but he uh, had this uh, struggle, if you like, to understand this whole conundrum, which was, you know, why do we see what we've come to regard as disease signs in healthy people? He couldn't understand it. And that Latin quotation there, hic signum ubi ulcus, any, any uh, classic, classical scholars in the audience, it actually means, here's the sign, but where's the disease? And reportedly, those were his last words, right? So to update us on that and, and to resolve that conundrum, we go to a much more modern or, or up-to-date researcher. Uh, this guy is Josef Deck, who was a medical doctor working in Germany in the mid, late, uh, the mid to late 20th century. He published a book called Iris Diagnosis in 1965, which is, for me, the, uh, the start of modern iridology. So he's really the father of modern iridology. And he introduced what we call the constitutional model of iridology based on genetics and in inherited predispositions, okay? So what he said basically was the iris is an inherited, genetic, familiarly driven structure. Um, and that as such, uh, it, it, it's visible shortly after birth. It's probably acted on by embryological conditions as well. We think a lot of the uh, development of the iris happens in utero and, and may be impacted or influenced greatly by the conditions in utero. Modern researchers, for example, has shown us that uh, it is actually to some extent possible to diagnose acute conditions by looking at what we call the embryological circuit in iridology. That's, a, that's quite advanced stuff, but we can actually make an assessment to some extent of the influences that might have shaped 
you know, all of our uh, lives and our bodies um, according to what happened to us when we were in the womb. But that idea that the iris might be a genetically derived pattern and it might carry the records or the prints of previous uh, generations, if you like, was a revolutionary new idea in iridology. And what it gave us was a method of understanding the answer to von Peskely's problem, which was, why do we see signs in the iris but no disease patterns there? The answer, because they are genetic footprints left there by previous generations. They may activate if we put sufficient um, pressure on them to become problems, but in themselves, uh, they're considered to be uh, inherited markings, okay? Uh, in other words, you don't have to get sick, folks. It might just be stuff that you've inherited, but if you know about it and you know the answer to, um, uh, to, to dealing with it, then theoretically you can uh, avoid the worst threats that your poor old parents pass down to you. Okay? So it identifies your weaknesses? It identifies your weaknesses and your susceptibilities, your vulnerabilities, that's right. Um, you might be interested to know, I mentioned this whole thing about iridology research. It's increasingly being taken up in the, in the Far East. Korea and China are becoming um, very significant research centers. Um, and uh, when we, has anybody looked online and tried to look up iridology? Anybody done that? Yeah. What did you find? Um, a couple years ago, there was research because one guy did um, iridology for cancer, and it was really rubbished a lot. Because you can't use really well, that's the point. This is the danger. If you think you can, you know, we, we, there used to be a teacher in the UK who would go through the front row of students saying, right, arthritis, bowel disease, um, thyroid, hypothyroidism, um, you know, irritable bowel and, and cancer, you know, and, and it scared the hell out of people. And that's not what we aim to do with iridology. We also aim to give people a positive experience. And, and so um, there are no flags that wave at you from the iris with names like cancer or you diabetes. You, what you can see is what I would call functional predispositions in the system. So for example, there are many signs that are associated with a predisposition to diabetes. If you see them, the first question I always ask is, is it in your family? Do you know about it? And if it is, then you've got a, a heightened risk factor. Uh, but if you also, uh, you might also want to start talking about the way in which diabetes might manifest before it becomes diabetes. So there's the hypoglycemia diabetes um, you know, which are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. So in other words, somebody who's heading for diabetes might be somebody with a very sweet tooth who is constantly snacking on sugary snacks, who needs to eat a lot of carbs in order to keep going, who experiences energy dips and you know, crashes and has to lift themselves up quickly. And because of the way we tend to look at these things in our society, you know, we go for the easy options, you know, the, 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 the sweet stall right near the supermarket checkout. Yeah, just as an afterthought, yes, I'll have a bunch of that, you know. And, um, and we associate sugar with easy energy, which it is. It's very quickly metabolized. It, it gives you a spike, but of course it lets you down. What do you think if you do that over and over and over again through the course of uh, maybe two or three, four decades, what do you think might happen? Uh, the whole sh blood sugar regulating machinery breaks down. Uh, you start to get insulin resistant. Um, and then it, it eventually the, pan the uh, uh, Langerhans, uh, beta cells in the uh, tail of the pancreas stop producing insulin altogether because they're exhausted. Uh, so in other words, you can see the signs of a potential diabetic, a long, uh, type 2 diabetic that is, not doesn't work for type 1, long before that disease actually manifests. And you can also see the signs in the, in the iris which would predict that that person might have those kind of problems. That doesn't mean to say that they're going to get diabetes. All it means to say is they have a weakness, a predisposition, it's a familial trait, they need to be aware of it and they need to do something about it. So they need a practitioner, uh, preferably trained in the College of Naturopathic Medicine, who knows how to respond to the causes and not just the symptom. Um, just mentioned Bernard Jensen, he was the great American naturopath. Most naturopaths in the Western world have studied either with Jensen or with somebody who knew him. I studied with Jensen himself long ago, I'm very proud to say, but my major teachers also were you know, uh, largely trained by this man. 
Um, he had a very functional view of the iris display, as we call it. Um, he regarded it as, uh, as an actual sort of instruction manual for how to look after the body, for what to detoxify and how, um, for what organs to support and how. And so he took a very literal view of iridology, but it's a very practical, very successful, very functional view. And I think that his system has become the most popular and the most successful throughout the planet. Every iridologist knows about Bernard Jensen and probably has a copy of his iris chart, which is still on sale down the road at the uh, Nutri Center. Um, Jensen died in 90, uh, sorry, 2001 at the age of 96, so he was a good example for what he preached. Um, and I think we owe a lot to Jensen. Now, the other thing you might know about um, iridology is the iris reflex chart. This is the one that I personally developed for uh, this book, which, I, which was published, my book, which was published in 2004. Um, and this is now in its uh, 12th language edition, by the way. So if you, are, if you want to read it in Japanese or Arabic <laughs> or Russian, it is available. Um, and it sold, uh, I think, something close on 300,000 copies in this country as well. So it's probably one of the most successful iridology books ever written, for which I take no personal responsibility. My publishers have done a really good job on it. But it's a very popular book amongst not only the lay public who, 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 who've bought it in, in droves, but also students. Um, and when I did the book, I was asked for a map, and, I, I, and you know, I'm not worthy. So I, I went to my teachers and I said, Do you, can I use your map? Um, Harry Wolf was, was, the, was the main one, and he said, I'd be delighted if you would use my map in your book. And I said, said send me a digital copy, and he said, there isn't one. It was, in, it, it was drawn up before, there were, uh, before we had uh, digital files. So I then went to another uh, close colleague of mine, Peter Bradbury, who runs the Guild of Naturopathic Iridologists, and I said, Peter, can I please use your map for my book? And he said, I'd be delighted if you'd use my map for your book. Uh, send me a digital copy. Oh, we've lost it. <laughs> So I had to make my own map, and I thought, oh, this is the last thing I needed to do. It's like an hour, a week before the deadline. Uh, so I sat there with a very old Macintosh computer using a very old in-house Macintosh program called Claris Works, which probably, uh, I don't know if anybody even remembers that. Um, uh, it's a very basic graphics patch package, and I did that, and I thought, it's all right. I'll send it to the publisher. The graphics designer will, will, will do something with it. He'll tart it up a lot, you know. And when I saw it, he'd done nothing with it at all. That's exactly <laughs> as I made it. Uh, but uh, interestingly, it's become very popular. Uh, a lot of students actually ask, I sell these, you know, um, actually ask to use Use my map. It's a very user-friendly map in many ways. So the idea of an iris map is that it gives you the positions of the various organs in the iris, which allows you to assess the relative strengths and weakness of each. So the some of the major features over the, uh, uh, this is the right iris, so over the, what we call the temporal side, which is the side nearest to the side of the face. We've got the lungs, the heart there. Um, the heart pops up in four reflexes, actually. One, two, three, and four on each side of the iris. Uh, we get the kidneys down here, the brain at the top, logically enough. And that's how we start to look at the iris as, uh, uh, for, for what it can tell us about individual organs. But that's not the whole point of doing an iris reading. It's not about isolating the heart, for example, as a weak organ. It's also about trying to understand the pressures <laughs> that might affect the heart as a result of the whole systemic functioning as well. So it's, in other words, it's not about splitting things up and singling out organs that are weak or in trouble. It's about looking at the way they interact as well. So we do a lot of geometry in iridology these days. We look at axial formations and radial formations and also concentric and circular formations to give us more and more layers of information. That's what I'm doing in the class um, here today, teaching them how to read the iris map. Um, so, that's, is, there, is there any truth that, that, um, on how white your eyes are, how well your lungs are, your livers are out there? There is a certain amount of truth in that, yeah. Um, uh, our eyes that become sort of yellowish and congested, the whites of the eye becomes yellowish and congested, can be a sign of of liver congestion, that's right. But the eye itself, the iris itself, as we, you know, in that little chart of Chinese, uh, the TCM approach to the iris, the iris itself is an indicator of liver health, interestingly enough. Um, I wanted to, sorry. You can also see kind of personality, like something very intense and it come, comes across their eyes. And you can. With a camera, there's a definitely a, yeah. 
It's very interesting, actually, that um, one of the, the, the few hardcore pieces of scientific verification of iridology has come to us through the route of, of genetics, gen genetics and embryology. Uh, we've identified which gene is responsible for the um, development of the iris in utero, and it's a gene called pa uh, PAX6. And if you look up PAX6, you will also find that it's responsible for the development not of individual organ function of any description, but of temperament and a person's personality and approach to life. Uh, and, and we do read, particularly when we're looking at the structure of the eye, we can read a lot about behaviour there too. And how a person, what I mean by that is how a person uh, responds to and adapts to the conditions of life, uh, what kind of um, account they give of themselves, if you like. Yeah? Is your brain connected with your eyes? And yeah. Connected? Well, the iris itself uh, is formed out of, uh, uh, of tissues which arise in in the embryo called the neuroectoderm, which means a sort of combination of, of, of epithelial or skin tissues and, uh, and nerve tissues. And the iris itself, uh, a lot of the iris is actually formed of nervous tissue. So it goes straight back, it's rooted right back into the brain, into an area near the thalami on each side. Yeah. Um, there's a lot we could say about that, but I wanted to end really just to show you a few pictures and talk a little bit about each individual. I haven't got much time left. Um, and just to say, here's a 41-year-old uh, woman who came to see me uh, suffering from atrial fibrillation, uh, which is that where the heart goes fluttery and very, very fast. Now, uh, she's quite young to have that at 41 years old. Um, and it was stress-related, basically. You know, we, we, I heard her story, and she was a single mother bringing up three children. She had a full-time job, usual thing. And she was working flat out, getting exhausted and all the rest of it. And then her heart started to malfunction. And just to point out, I mean, if I looked at those eyes, I wouldn't necessarily say atrial fibrillation. I might be talking about digestion or something like that. But when I looked, I saw so-called weakness markings in all four heart zones. Okay, which would be a big feature in iridology. When all four zones are marked, we know something is likely to happen with the heart. And I also saw this marking here, this big fat furrow, right in the, sort of like a crease in the upper portion of the iris that goes right through the pituitary hypothalamus and is a well-known sign for people who are susceptible to stress. So in other words, putting those two very simple uh, signs or sets of signs together, we get that diagnosis, if you like, stress-related heart disease. Um, this is very, very simplistic. There's a lot more you can say about each of these, but if I just sort of give you, give you a basic idea. Uh, this gentleman um, came to me suffering from a chronic fatigue syndrome with multiple sensitivities, you know, the sort of thing where you can't stand to be near perfume or strong smells, chemical smells, that sort of thing. And it's usually associated with gut dysbiosis, which is a disturbance of gut immunity. I think there was a study done in the 1980s, some, uh, some stage, um, which was reported by, does anybody know the magazine, uh, What Doctors Don't Tell You? Do you know that one? A sort of review of medical literature that never reaches the light of day. Uh, and their study showed that about 80% of people with uh, ME or chronic fatigue suffer from uh, dysbiosis or candidosis as it was called, that, that's a disruption of the natural gut flora. And when we get this faint uh, sort of wash of yellowish colour around the middle of the, uh, of the iris, around the central portion of the iris, which we associate, as I said, with digestive problems, we get a strong disposition towards dysbiosis. So again, we're looking at uh, treating the gut and cleaning up the gut as part of a treatment for um, for, for the condition that he had. But again, um, just pointing out the, the basic feature which will probably have jumped out at all of you with these eyes, this mark here, is a mark that is um, bang on the pituitary gland, in, if you look at the iris. When I saw that, <coughs> due to certain other experiences that I had, previous experiences, previous patients that I'd seen, I immediately thought something stuck in the pituitary, and actually it's a mercury problem. You know mercury tends to accumulate in the pituitary gland and also in the adrenal gland, so basically I was able to suggest that part of his condition at least was down to mercury intoxication of the pituitary gland. He got himself tested and guess what, his mercury levels were uh, through the roof. So again, it gave us the, uh, the tools we needed to, to get to the bottom of the condition. Did you go on treat that? 
treat I did treat that, yes. Uh, I didn't treat it alone. There are other, there are other things involved, but I, 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 was, uh, I was doing some... Um, certainly, I, I, I tackled the bowel side of things and, and the detox side of things. Um, this is a 14-year-old boy. Um, wonderful child, actually. I mean, I've never known a child of that age take a really seriously focused interest in his own uh, medical condition. He was um, diagnosed as a result of a family breakdown. Uh, he developed both Crohn's disease, which you might know as an autoimmune condition affecting uh, the intestines, and segmented ulcerative colitis, both in one. Two forms of inflammatory bowel disease in one person. Uh, what the iris shows us is that the connective tissue in the intestines is uh, of low resolution, if you like. It's a low density, lots of holes in the texture. It's almost like the connective tissue isn't holding well together. And what happens in Crohn's disease, of course, is tissues become, uh, as they say, friable and start to fall apart. And once that happens, the only remedy is to have a portion of the small intestine usually cut out um, so that you can preserve the rest of the digestive tract intact. But if you don't deal with the underlying problem, which is an autoimmune inflammation, quite often kicked off by stress, then you will find progressively that more and more and more of the bowel will start falling apart. So this was a very successful outcome. We started treating him with herbs, and he was better within about two weeks. Um, his bowel motions, which had been sort of 10 or 15 a day, were now down to two or three a day. Um, he, his level of pain and inflammation had receded. His bowel motions themselves were normal. Um, and his doctors were completely amazed. His blood values, his ESR went down to, the, uh, uh, to, to within the normal range, and he's been able to lead a normal life ever since. The only time he gets problems is when there's echoes of that family problem uh, start to come back into his life. It's all centered around his mother, and his mother basically rejected him, and every time he goes to see her, he gets upset, and the whole thing threatens to start up again. So this is careful management. He's still a patient of mine. He's now 18 years old, so four years later, but he's avoided the surgery, and he was basically for the chop very quickly if, if we hadn't done that, okay? So again, the iris shows it. Weak connective tissue in the, um, in the digestive zone. There are a lot of other things we could comment on there that are particularly indicative of an autoimmune condition as well, which we don't really have time to go through. Um, it's about half past two, I, I need to stop. Uh, there might be time for one or two very quick questions, if you want, yeah.